couple of folks. So hopefully you've had excellent experiences. Um, we like to say that a research university is a writing university, and it is our job to provide support to everybody in the campus community by giving feedback on writing and doing presentations like this one. Um, so if you have any questions about the Writers Workshop, I'll be happy to take those at the end of our presentation today. Um, but I want everybody to get excited about using the Writers Workshop as a resource, not just for course papers, assignments, things like that, but also for being a resource for your professional writing as well. Okay? So just to give me a starting point for who you are and some of your concerns, um, I'd like to get your answers to these questions. And I know Miles might be full, but do your best. Um, so what are some questions you've had when writing professional emails? Let's start there. So I'm sure you've all written professional emails. What are some questions that you have had in relationship to tone, style, format, anything like that? Yeah. Uh, like how do you usually highlight the text? Like people use different colors, but if there is a weightage or how to do it professionally? Yeah. Yeah, so how do you highlight text? How do you draw attention to maybe that most important information in highlighting or bold? That's a good question. Good, good. Other questions that you have come up with? Yeah. Um, I feel like normally it's a pretty good to balance like being like congenial or being like warm yeah. with still maintaining the professional Yeah. 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 Yeah
right? So there are a lot of factors that could go into that. So we know that people become expert writers by writing for different audiences, with different purposes, in different genres, and different contexts. And the more that you do that, and the more that you think purposefully about that, the more adaptive and efficient and expert you will be as a writer. So in the context of um, US academic and professional writing, um, we can have a few assumptions about audience expectations. So we have certain cognitive um, biases that um, lead readers to want it easy. So as readers, we expect the writer to do the heavy lifting of making sense of things for us. So readers expect unity, coherence, and emphasis, which is basically the idea that in this communication, everything's gonna be unified around some central idea um, everything is going to flow and follow, you know, specific logic, logical uh, patterns. Um, and that the main points will be well developed and, you know, situated according to their importance. So typically the most important item is the first item. So that notion of having certain kinds of information in power positions is something that's true on the level of the whole text, um, but also in relationship to the paragraph and even sentences. Uh, so the more you hone your writing, the more you'll notice this, that we, like, we really pay attention to the beginnings and the ends of things. Um, so as you're writing, we'll talk about this a little bit more, pay extra attention to the start and the end of communications, of paragraphs, and as you are you know, really working on polishing your craft, even um, where is the most important information in your sentences, right? Not buried in the middle, but the beginning or the end. And then finally, readers are hardwired to look for actors and actions. So when we start thinking about these basic tips for professional writing, that means you're paying attention to your subjects and your verbs. Um, and I'll, I'll say more about this, but if we don't see these things immediately in a text, readers tend to feel that um, their expectations are being violated in some way. So they tend to feel that the text is not as efficient as they would like, um, or their experience reading it is more difficult than they would like it to be. So the more that we can do to make it easy for our readers, the better communicators we will be, and the more we'll rise through the ranks of our careers, right? Do you guys have questions about this so far? So, oh. Yes. Yeah, um, I was just going to ask if there's something you said for like, brevity, um, but in the sense of like, paying attention to the things, like if we have trouble, um, like for me, when I'm writing an email, I have trouble convincing other things I want to get across as much information as possible. Yeah. yeah. So, brevity and concision are challenging, especially when we have a lot of a lot of information that we're trying to communicate. So trying to um, you know think about these tips in relationship to also communicating fully and responsibly. I'm going to say a little bit more about that um, as we move into the presentation. But I think that that is one of the, the biggest challenges that we face in professional communication is how do we keep this audience centric? but also get all the information out there. Okay. Okay. So one last word about audience purpose and context. Um, in addition to thinking about who you're writing to, think about what your writing is aiming to achieve. Uh, so uh, planning leads to perfection, right? So just taking a moment to think ahead of time is going to be helpful. Are you writing to inform somebody, to persuade them of an action? to dispute something that has come up in, in prior communication, um, to invite uh, you know, a response or a meeting or whatever it might be, um, to confirm information, uh, to, to make an inquiry, to ask for approval, to reject or approve something yourself, to propose or suggest something. So there are lots of purposes in our writing and just thinking early on is gonna be helpful. Um, so, uh, there is um, uh, a writer, uh, Brian Garner, uh, who you may know from the Harvard Business Review, 
And he tells writers that um, the mistake that many people make is they start reading prematurely. So they think out their thoughts as they're writing, um, which can make things less structured, meandering, and repetitive. So again, thinking about your purpose up front and your goal of communication is going to help you be an effective and clear communicator so that you have collected your thoughts up front. So I'm going to move into some tips for email etiquette. Uh, before I do that, any other kind of general big picture considerations? Any questions or comments before we move on? OK. So we've all written probably hundreds, if not thousands, of emails. Right? This is not a new form of communication. But as we are moving into the workplace and professional setting, it's worthwhile just to take a step back and remind ourselves of some of the basics and again, putting ourselves in the kind of the, the shoes of our audience and what they might be expecting to see from our email communication. So we are going to work through some basics of reading, salutations, um, subject lines, and then just some tips for correspondence. Okay. Um, so uh, how do you address an email? So what would you say is um, the the least appropriate of the, the first time greetings that you see on this slide. If you're contacting somebody for the first time, which, which of these might you not go with? Look, from this table, what did you say? Hi, right, so we probably wouldn't go with hi, a little informal, right? Um, we probably wouldn't go with, hi, Sarah, if we've never met this person before, right? We don't know them personally yet, um, so we want to use uh, the title. Um, we want to do our best to um, actually include the person's name and title, so doing a little bit of research if necessary. Um, so in general, to whom it may concern should be a last resort, right? We want to personalize our communication, and so sometimes that might mean doing a little bit of research to make sure that we know who we are talking to. Um, so use the title. Um, you can always use the, the formulation of dear plus title plus last name. What do you do if you are um, not sure about somebody's title or gender? So if we can't say, dear Mr. Jones, because we're not sure about that person's title, what would you do? You see your name alone. Full name? Full name, yes, right? So pretty basic. Do you guys have any questions about this? OK. And then in closing, um, so again, we have a range here. Um, so. Um, in professional contexts, usually closing like best or best regards is going to be used pretty frequently. Um, those that are a little bit more informal would be those like kindly, yours truly, love, we're not going to use that, peace, we're not going to use that, cheers, probably not. I see that a little bit more often these days, but certainly not with somebody that you uh, have not worked with before. So again, erring on the side of formality in our salutations and closings. Uh, are there any others that you use frequently? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Sincerely. Right. So many options out there, but again, just considering the, the tone that we want to adopt. Subject lines are important, right? Subject lines are what the recipient of an email is going to use to uh, initially screen them and decide what we're going to respond to and how swiftly. So a uh, good subject line is going to identify your reason for making contact, right? Think in terms of the, the keywords of the message that you're sending. Um, and we want to avoid um, including urgent um, or flagging things as urgent. Usually they are not, right? And unless unless you have a, a, real, a real reason to do that. Again, pretty rarely. Um, what do you think makes a bad subject line? Just writing from and your name. Yeah, so just like writing from your name, something like that. Anything very, very long subject line. We don't want it to be a sentence. Yeah. 
Yeah, did you do something else? Yeah, I think something is very vague and it's related to what you're actually trying to tell in the media. Something really vague, so you can't even tell what the email is about. Not having one, uh, this is something that happens to me sometimes when I'm teaching and being an administrator on campus, so having a subject line is important. Good. So, um, you know, if you are imagining the situation, um, you just went to a business career fair and had a conversation with a recruiter from Wells Fargo about a position that is perfect for you. You want to write them a follow-up email. Uh, which, if any, of these subject lines would you use? Would you use one or would you go with something different? Something different? Yeah, because like request for position, that is fine, but we talked about is a little big way. Yeah. To be uh, precise about it. Yeah. Right, selfies are a little bit vague. Um, they, don't, they don't have that precision of what the position is. Um, and some of them are also a little bit informal. I want to apply, probably not your best representation of yourself. Thanks is going to be both informal and vague, right? So again, uh, being brief but also precise. So um, when you are thinking about um, emailing recruiters in general, again, um, ask yourself that audience question, why am I writing this email? Keep it short but formal. Um, keep the position in mind, be specific, and consider whether or not you expect a reply. Um, so again, we're, we're focusing a little bit on these kind of general tips for job search writing, but many of these principles are going to be relevant um, for, for other types of communication as well. Yeah. As a recruiter, yes, please. <laughs> yes. Um, I also I attend many career fairs, so it's also very helpful if in your subject line you say follow up from whatever the name of the career fair was. So if you can tell me where I saw you, I see thousands of you, it helps if you put it in context for me as a recruiter and say, I spoke to you at, right? I saw you at. Uh, that way when I start, I can match your, hopefully your name or your resume or whatever to the stack that I have from that specific career fair. So it's very helpful if your subject says, great, you know, great to meet you at XYZ career fair or follow up from XYZ career fair. That's much more helpful as a recruiter. Thank you so much for that. So audience purpose and context, right, is going to be helpful. Did you want to add something or yeah, ask something? Yeah, I have a yeah. Um, About su uh, subject line, mm -hmm. what's your opinion on um, abbreviating, like with regards to uh, FYI, things like that? Right? Ah. Uh huh. So abbreviations and subject lines. So my initial response is to avoid them. Um, if other people would debate that, I would love to hear your opinion. Um, but again, I think that it's erring too much on the side of brevity, and um, abbreviations don't tend to carry a formality with them. So I would really just again use use the keywords instead of using the abbreviations. Yeah. I think it helps if you know the person. Yeah. 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 I've definitely done that with bosses where I wanted them actually required and then the subject. FYI and then the subject, right? So they can prioritize. I need to look at this right now. I can look at this tomorrow. I can just hit the delete key because I hate it when she emails me. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, other, other questions before we move on? Not yet? So. Let's look at an example, all right? So this is in that context of recruitment still. Um, so imagine um, that you, know, you had been meeting with this Wells Fargo recruiter at a UIUC um, career fair. Um, so take a moment and read through this and let me know um, what you might revise in this message, okay? So subject, thanks for our chat. Dear Jennifer, it was cool to meet you at the career fair. I was happy to talk to you about your company, Wells Fargo. I hope that you think to hire me soon because I graduate in May 2018 and I hope to have a job then. So what might you revise given our tips so far? 
like from the subject to the content, everything. Everything. <laughs> everything. <laughs> <laughs> right? So this is, again, a little bit beg, airing on the side of informality rather than formality. Um, this probably isn't going to get you very far, right? So here is a, a version of, of a revised draft. So we have a different subject line. You want to see career fair? Thank you. Dear Jennifer, it was good to meet you at UAUC's College of Business Career Fair. I appreciated your insights about Wells Fargo, and I am highly motivated to pursue a position there when I graduate in May. Thanks again for your time and information. Best regards. So, some things that I would point out here, again, so more formal, more specific in the subject line, um, uh, a little bit um, less informal about you know, the goal of having a job uh, in general, but a job with Wells Fargo. Um, would there be anything else that you would hope to see as a recruiter in a follow-up message like this? We talked about something specific. Mm -hmm. If there was something that, again, might jog my memory and help separate your conversation with me from all the other conversations I have, mm -hmm. I will often tell students in the recruiting line, when you send me a follow-up email afterwards, remind me that we spoke about whatever. That helps me pick you back out of the thousand kids I spoke to that day. So if there's if there's something that, that was if you made a connection with that recruiter or something, I would add it, I would add a sentence there and help remind them about about that unique conversation or that unique topic. Because you want them to remember you. Yeah, thank you. Good. Other questions, comments right now? Just looking at the time. Okay. So we put at you know some context where um, you have had some prior introduction to a person. I want to take just a moment to think about you know how you might be um, contacting somebody to introduce yourself maybe for um, an informational interview or submitting a cover letter, some, some situation like that. So um, our recommendation uh, in this email context is to introduce yourself in the first sentence. Um, so we have some examples here. I'm a first year MBA student at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, as well as a director of the Enterprise Association, blah, blah. We have another um, Option there, I am a first year student at X University School of Law and I'm interested in obtaining a position with your firm for the summer of 2018. So trying to put um, salient information about yourself um, up front, right? Again, to give them a little bit of context about you um, and why you are contacting them. Um, I'm not gonna dwell on this. Um, it, uh, for anybody who might find it useful, we have a note here about article and Position use because sometimes it's confusing uh, when we're uh, talking about majors and schools and departments and programs. Um, so uh, prepositions are tricky, um, and if you're not sure, I recommend um, googling it to see if the phrase that you're thinking about comes up regularly. Okay, um, and of course, this is something we can help with at the writers workshop. So let's look at an example, uh, and then we'll pause again. So. Um, again, thinking about this as um, an introductory email seeking an informational interview. Uh, so we have two Niha Patel, subject introducing myself. Um, dear Niha, I'm a student at UIUC and I wanted to introduce myself to you because your job is important and it is good for me to have contact with you. I hope that you can remember me and keep me in mind for jobs with your position. Love, Carolyn. So, you guys are laughing, so what, what are some problems with this? Yeah. Our closing is probably not our best uh, closing, right? So again, probably not love in formal professional contexts. What are some other things that you might uh, revise here? I mean, instead of writing, I wanted to introduce myself, you'd rather introduce yourself. <laughs> yeah, right? So instead of doing the thing, they're saying they would like to do the thing. Yeah, uh huh, good, good. Any other observations about this one? It's very straightforward. Good. 
so, um, so again, we want to keep in mind what is the purpose of this email, what are we hoping to achieve. We want to get to the point and, and do the thing instead of saying that we're going to do the thing. Being formal and doing our research, right? So to, to think about how we might be addressing the message. So this would be a revised version. Dear Dr. Patel, request for informational interview. I am an MBA student at the UNC School of Business, specializing in whatever. I wanted to reach out to you because whatever you would like to achieve, would it be possible to schedule a 30 minute coffee chat? Um, so there we're actually including the action that the writer is seeking, right? Could we schedule this chat? So um, inviting a response. So again, also brief, um, putting that information about yourself right in the first sentence. Um, any, any questions or comments about this? Again, reaching out to somebody who you've never met before. Yeah. What did they call you? What did they cost you? I think that's a, a, you know, something that happens for sure, right? So do you, you can send it again. How long would you wait before reaching out again? I'll say like seven days ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. A week is good, right? Probably not um, 24 hours. That's probably a little too fast, right? So giving people some time to catch up with their inbox and, and things like that. Yeah, that would be appropriate. Okay. Uh huh. Oh, would it be all right to include your name in the subject? Or you know, my inclination would be not to do that. Although I wonder if. Uh, other other folks in the room have uh, a response to that, including your name in the subject line. Yeah, taking up space. Yeah. So again, if we're erring on the side of brevity, you know, the the main idea is in the subject line, so that the action there. Um, and I would save your name for the um, the, the closing. Mm -hmm. Good question. Good. Yeah. But when, for example. <coughs> My name shows up, right? For an introduction, 30 minutes would be pretty standard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that's pretty fair. Yeah, yeah. Good. Other questions or comments? Yeah. Um, in this situation where you're wanting to schedule an like, in-person meeting with somebody, is it important to like, gauge their expectations by like, giving them their full time? Or like, would it be OK to just ask, like, would you want to schedule the chat and just leave it at the mercy of like, their schedule? I think that would be fair as well. So instead of indicating a specific time, you know, would it, it be possible to schedule a coffee chat, you know, within the next few weeks or something like that? So you don't have to necessarily specify. Um, I think that it is um, fair to leave it to their, their decision and, and their follow-up. Yes? Um, if you're trying to schedule a time to speak with a professional, someone who's currently working as opposed to an academic or recruiter, mm -hmm. um, would the expectations for in-person versus virtual and the amount of time be different? That's a great question. Um, my initial response is that probably the amount of time would be the same, right? So you, same kind of activity, um, and that I, in terms of format, my guess would be that you would think he would be looking at like a digital modality, um, just given likelihood of being at a distance. Um, does anybody else want to respond to that? Just thinking about does the context change if you're corresponding with somebody who is a current working professional as opposed to um, a professor um, or perhaps a, a recruiter? Does anybody want to add to that at all? I think I would let the person who, to whom you're asking the favor mm -hmm. drive that. Yeah. And let them decide whether you want. And, and then if they don't specify in person or digital, then you can ask the question and follow up, would you prefer? Um, but so much of what we, so much of what used to be accepted has gone out of the window in the last two years. <laughs> so, right. Yeah, so, so context have changed, and I think it's, it's, it would always be fair to say something like, would it be possible to schedule um, a, a time to chat at, at your convenience in a modality of your choice? You know, you could always gesture 
toward leaving that decision in their hands. Yeah. Good. So, um, if you have received uh, an interview request, um, we have a few tips to keep in mind here. Um, so, uh, in general, you're going to be responding to an email through an email, right? So, not switching modalities on them. And you'll be typically responding within the same email thread so that you maintain that context of the conversation. So, no need to start a, a new email, just you know, hit, hit reply. Again, you want to use a formal salutation, um, specify the, the reason if necessary, um, potentially ask for a response, and then use an appropriate closing. Um, so this would be one example. Um, so, dear Mrs. Smith, thank you for inviting me to interview for a position as a customer service representative with your company. I'm very excited to be considered for this position, and I look forward to having a chance to meet with you. Per the scheduling options suggested in your email, I would like to schedule an interview with you on this date. Um, it is my understanding that the interview will take place at your corporate office, which is located here. Um, please confirm if this time is convenient for you and that I have the correct location. Um, so you might not necessarily have to confirm the location if that has already been made clear, um, but if there is uncertainty about it, as we were discussing, you could incorporate something like that. Um, again, note the specificity here, um, the, the polite maneuvers in the first paragraph, um, and then also just notice that each paragraph is very succinct, right? The first one is a thanks, the second one is here's the date and time that you're selecting, and then the last one is here's my confirmation and request for follow-up if needed. Okay. Um, questions or comments about this? Um, and then, of course, after you have an interview um, or you know, perhaps a meeting with somebody, you might send a, a follow-up email as well. Um, so especially after an interview, you want to send that thank you within 24 hours. Um, again, use a specific reference from the interview so the interview will remember you, like we had mentioned in terms of conversations with recruiters. Um, ask about next steps if relevant, and um, if you want more information about this process, we have it at our website, which you can't see here, but go to a Writer's Workshop and we have resources for um, job and professional writing. Um, so this would be an example of a short um, interview follow-up email. Um, so dear Ms. Smith, I wanted to thank you again for the opportunity to interview with your company. I enjoyed our conversation about something specific that came up. And the position sounds like an exciting opportunity. I'm looking forward to hearing any updates you can share, and don't hesitate to contact me if you need any further information. Thank you. So for me, when, when I'm interviewing people for my positions, it's always nice to receive a thank you because it demonstrates the professionalism and follow through of the person, even if I maybe don't read the thank you letter, right? So. You probably wouldn't get a response to this, but it is showing your credibility, your follow through, your sense of the context. Does anybody have questions or comments about this? So I'm going to move into some general tips for business writing. So moving out of the context of just to focus on email etiquette and email communication. Any questions about email etiquette before we move along? Yes. Sorry. Uh, this might be a one more subject. I know it's uh, on the uh, so currently all the way this you know, the calendar schedule means, right? Mm -hmm. You send them, oh, just put the time on my calendar. Yeah. Uh, and depending on context, it's very hard to formulate the top you could do measure the top. Like, yeah. you just go here and, you know, like, or, like, basically, is there a more or less measured tone that one could use with another one, or yeah. So the question here is basically about, you know, kind of what's the what's the appropriate tone, or is there is there a kind of blanket tone that you can use, especially in the context of um, calendar invitations? 
Yeah, like, yeah. hey, let's not do back and forth scheduling time, uh -huh. just go and like book a time on my calendar. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think that is happening a lot. And I think, you know, if someone has a, invited you to do that, go ahead and, of course, follow through. And for me, I think what's most important is just having some clarity of what the meeting is for. So making sure that the, it says something specific in the um, kind of like the subject for the meeting. Um, and then any specific details that I would need um, to be primed for um, to get ready for that meeting. Um, and I, for me, I think that the tone is probably maybe one step down in terms of the register that we've been looking at. So we've been looking at a pretty formal register. And I think in this context where you have um, a, a relationship with somebody, it would be fine to adopt the kind of tone that you're talking about. Yeah. I think for myself, I think whenever you're concerned about tone, erring on the side of formality or, or professionalism is, is always the best choice to go. It's like when you're writing course papers and you have questions about, should I be citing this? And your teacher is like, if you're not sure, the best thing to do is just to cite it. I would say the same thing for adopting tone in, in workplace communication. Okay? It'll never hurt you to err on the side of professionalism. Good. Other, other questions? So I know we have maybe about 10 minutes left. Um, so I want to hit on just a few um, key characteristics of professional writing, you know, tips that you can take with you um, from today's presentation as you're thinking about the different varied forms of communication um, that you are engaged in. So of course, like everything else, it will be audience oriented. We're thinking about our reader first and how do we make this reader friendly. Your writing should be planned and organized. So again, take a moment at the beginning to think about what you're aiming to communicate, what needs to be included. Even, you know, jot down a note or something for yourself so that you have a little bit of a structure going into it. We will be accurate. We will be efficient. Um, again, efficient for the reader especially. So making sure that the most important information is in clearly identifiable places that have weight. Um, we will aim for clarity in our writing. I'll say a few words about that. Um, we'll think about how we're making the information usable. Again, making sure that it is accessible. And then your writing is going to be reviewed and edited, right? So if you're thinking about things that are um, longer than an email, um, whether it's a, a memo or a summary or, or whatever else you might be uh, composing. So, um, when I ask people, what is most important to you in professional communication, what I hear most often is the most important information should be easily accessible and identifiable to the reader. So sometimes people will use the phrase bottom line up front. That's what BLUFF stands for. Um, so as you are you know, writing or reviewing your writing, um, think about, um, you know, for each, um, each section, each paragraph that you're working on, what is the goal, right? What is the purpose of this text? What are you trying to um, uh, get the reader to do or to understand? And then use that to guide these questions about what must you include and what don't you need to include. And sometimes asking yourself questions like this will be useful for thinking about how um, can I be brief but still convey the information that needs to be conveyed? Um, so sometimes thinking through what comes first is, is going to be important there. So let's look at a quick example. This is drawn from, oops. This is drawn from a, a summary. Um, so the, the goal here is for the recipient of this um, summary to um, be able to make decisions about um, marketing uh, based on the information that they're receiving here. So you're trying to give them information about trends that you have noticed because you have done the research, making the research that you did usable to the reader. So every time a business or consumer purchases products or services, they display forms of buyer behavior that are influenced by many factors. The following report looks at the fast food industry and will analyze four McDonald's key products and services. It highlights what type of consumer buying or business buying behaviors are displayed in the purchase of a product or service and explains what each behavior may occur. 
This enables a conclusion to be drawn from applying theory to reality. Although a full comprehension of buying behaviors is impossible, since everyone is an individual, it is useful to reflect on common behaviors and attempt to divide behaviors in types and stages. Even McDonald's, a leader in marketing, can always predict consumer behavior. So if we're thinking about those principles of being reader-friendly, um, maybe action-oriented, providing usable information, highlighting the most important information, what might be working well here? What, what might you revise? Right? What is working less well for you as a reader? Yeah. Um, from the whole full comprehension, like from that sentence on seems not really relevant to the first two thirds of it. Mm -hmm. Right. So the the end here from the sentence, although a full comprehension on, pretty vague, not very relevant, not actually giving us a snapshot of the findings of the research that they've done. Right. So it it, it does not provide that usable or actionable information. Are there other elements of this that you would maybe tweak, revise? Yeah. Uh, I think it's kind of like hard to read if it's like one block of text and like, like break it up into multiple. Yeah, so you know, it could be hard to read as a big block of text, so potentially thinking about different ways of guiding the reader through that information, whether it is maybe breaking up the paragraphs, or maybe um, if we have these um, you know, four key products, maybe we're gonna list them, or you know, uh, uh, tell us what these buying behaviors are, so including um, a clear statement of that, and potentially cutting some of what we see at the end as being less relevant. Yeah, so again, thinking about um, telling the reader what those results are, the conclusions that have been drawn, and what the recommendations will be, so that they have a snapshot of the whole summary from just the first paragraph, right? Good. And then when we are thinking about um, style, um, so not just you know the content and, and how we're aiming to achieve, but the, the writing itself, some tips that I have for you are to use direct sentences um, it is, I think, better to err on the side of shorter direct sentences than on lots of complex compound sentences. So shorter, again, helps readers digest that information more efficiently. Use action verbs. Um, so make your verbs count. Right? We talked about actors and actions. Um, make every word count. Um, so really check for fluff, even on the level of the, the phrases that you're using. And in general, avoid jargon. There might be cases where that's gonna be useful or important to employ, but generally, err on the side of putting things in, in kind of plain English, right? So um, avoiding too much jargon or um, too many abbreviations. So some strategies that you can use when you are going through your writing and reviewing it for concision and specificity would be finding words like adverbs, so those like L-Y words, right? So words like extremely or hugely or helpfully or fortunately, um, and just ask yourself if that's interesting or um, important or if you can just cut it from the sentence altogether. So whenever I need to be really thinking about concision, adverbs are the first thing to go. They're usually extraneous to the sentence. And then thinking about qualifiers, so those are words that might um, amplify, um, so words like very, or a lot, or often, or really, and again, often those words aren't actually doing that much work for us, so we can just cut those out altogether. Uh, sometimes looking for um, this idea of biz speak, so again, thinking about jargon and just like wordy phrases, are there different ways of saying this? So. The, these might be phrases like the fact that, in the event that, at the end of the day, forward, initiative, probably just say initiative there, um, the current situation, right? So just thinking about these are phrases that we use that just sort of tend to pack the text rather than really deliver information. Um, so something else to put in our kind of editing toolkit. Okay. Um, when we're thinking about our verbs, 
Um, there may be times when you're using passive voice, um, but in general, think about limiting your be verbs and using active voice. So again, get your verbs to do a lot of work for you. Um, and I think at the end of this, I have some resources that also include some um, kind of helpful action verbs if you're looking for ideas. Limit sentence length, as we've said, and then um, for clarity, I recommend avoiding beginning sentences with words like, it is, this could, there is, why might that be something that you would edit for? Uh, it was the case that, and then um, this was our finding, and there is um, further uh, steps to be taken. What happens to you as a reader when you have a series of sentences like that? Yeah. You just lose track of the information Yeah, you're like, what are you talking about? Exactly. So, again, um, our, our subjects do a lot of work for us, um, and if we're using um, these pronoun phrases a lot, then that tends to lead to a lack of clarity in our writing. Um, so one thing that I, I recommend doing is just, you know, if you're working on something that's really important, maybe something that is lengthier, highlight the first couple words of each sentence. That helps you zoom in both on sentence length and then also how you are beginning your sentences. It will help you quickly assess, um, you know, if you have a, a lot of these kind of pronoun phrases at the beginning. Do you guys have questions about any of this? This is pretty straightforward. Um, so I think that we are basically out of time. Um, I have some resources here for you that might be useful. Um, so um, these are you know, tips about business and workplace writing from places uh, that are gonna be go-to resources. Um, so places like the um, Harvard Business Review and elsewhere. So, um, feel free to take a look. I'm not sure if the slides will be able to be made available. Yeah, so you can certainly go back to this. And um, of course, make use of your campus services, um, whether that is your college's career center or the campus career center or the writer's workshop. Um, so again, we work with not just course papers, but we are also happy to work with your professional writing as well. Um, we have pretty limited summer hours, but I did want to flag that in the fall and spring semester, we usually have 40 to 45 of our writing coaches on staff, and we are interdisciplinary. So I always have people from the College of Business on staff, so you can come and you can talk to people who um, are well-versed in the kind of writing that you are doing. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and just leave the rest of this information for you to look at um, at, at a later time. Are there any questions before I, I wrap up today? Thank you for your time. Enjoy your summers. Good luck with your internships. And we hope to see you at the Writers' Workshop. Thanks, everybody.